This episode of Hydro Show is sponsored by Hydro Mag, the UK's independent hydroponics magazine. Hello, I'm here with Jason from Autopot. He's very kindly invited us to their research and development centre here in Oxford. Jason, thank you very much. Good to meet you. Um, so can you give us a little bit of a background of the sort of things that you do here at the uh, Research and Development Centre? Well, generally we start in January. Um, we raise the plants from seeds. Um, we use just standard compost mix. Um, we raise them indoors under uh, lights. And then probably about the end of January, no, probably the end of March, we um, basically bring them indoors and put them on the raised benches behind us. Mm -hmm. um, we then pot up into 10 centimetre pots using Alpha Mix this year uh, from Growth Technology, which we've used throughout the nursery. And there's a variety of herbs that we're actually raising on the benches, which are sweet basil, holy basil, and also spicy basil, and an assortment of uh, a few other plants. Um, these plants are raised here they're cut back several times. We sell the uh, cut herbs and uh, we also take the pots to market as well. Once we've moved the plants over to the greenhouse or to the main area um, on the benches, what we do to maintain the temperature around the plant in the early part of the season is to obviously turn the power on. The trays sit on, on obviously the soil beds. We've got warmth coming up from below, which is approximately 21 degrees and also we can bring cloches over the top of the plants to maintain the temperature during the day and also during the night. Um, once we've um, established the plants and the root mass is obviously built up inside the plot, we then take the plants into the main greenhouse where the, uh, the chilies and aubergines that we're going to show you next. Uh, so before we do move on, can you give us a little bit of information of how to care for these plants in the early stage of the season? Yeah, most definitely. Obviously, because plants are small, you treat them like children. You don't feed them large amounts of food in the early parts of their life. Um, so holding back on a young plant with regards to water and nutrients in the early part of the season, obviously we're outdoors, we're not under um, lights or, in, or in, indoors. So we have to be very, very careful how we maintain the root zone. We obviously use the heat from below and we sparingly water and feed the plants throughout the duration until the, the nighttime temperatures and the daytime temperatures sort of balance out. Uh, the plants then obviously will take off and once the plants are established then we can move them on into their main area. Okay, so you mentioned there that you only water the plants lightly in the early stages, why is that? Um, because it, there's a small root system there uh, and you, you really need to try and make a plant work for what's given to it. If you overfeed a plant, you'll generally produce a sickly plant. So it's really important, and this is across all walks of horticulture, that in the early stages, experts in, 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 in crop production always sort of make drive that plant hard in the early stages of its life. And then once it's established, then, then obviously they can feed it more. But giving it too much at a young stage is just is, is not suitable for a young plant. So how do you know when the root zone's established so you can move it to a larger pot? Really, we just take the plant out of the pot, have a look at it, uh, and then move it onto the next plot. It really is that simple. It's um, after 25 years of horticulture, it's, um, it, it becomes sort of second nature to be able to spot when a plant needs potting up or need moving on. But you could keep a plant in a very small pot as long as you're there religiously watering it and tending to it day in, day out. You could keep it in a small pot, but for the purposes of what we need, we traditionally move on to the next size plant or plant pot. Okay, well, let's have a look at the next size then. Lovely. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. So, right, what have we got here then, Jason? Well, this whole area, Nick, is um, obviously it's the auto pot, two pot trays. Um, everything's supplied using the flexi tanks. We've just got plain water in here. And um, the mix in the pots is uh, growth technology, the alpha mix. We've decided to use this area. We've got a variety of plants from cucumbers, various tomato varieties. Um, but what we're using here is we're using bio tablets. Um, and the tablets are simply buried in the pots, a liquid's poured through, and then the uh, whole process is probably repeated probably about eight to ten weeks later. 
So it's one of the only products that we can really use with Autopot that's organic because organics we can't we can't use liquid organics with with um, Autopot and you can't really use liquid organics with any systems that require small lines mm -hmm. because they have a tendency to block. Um, so the the guys from Auto, um, from BioTabs they've come up with this product. We've tested it this year across a huge variety of plants. And to be honest with you, it's been very, very successful. Um, I'm quite impressed with the way it's worked this year. Um, it's been very simple. Um, you simply bury the tablets in the pots. Um, the great thing is that we haven't had to constantly monitor the tanks with the pH and the EC. It's just plain water. Uh, and then they just need to be recharged probably, probably 10 to 12 weeks later. We've grown a huge variety of crops and um, they seem to have held their own. They've been very simple and quite productive. I've been quite impressed. So what type of growing medium are you using here? Um, throughout the nursery, it's uh, Alpha Mix from Growth Technology. Um, we found it's quite a nice mix to use. Um, it's full of lava sand and lots of um, organic and um, minerals and, and various other particles. We've used it for two seasons on the nursery now. Um, and it's, it, it, it feels very heavy um, in weight, but it's very, very free draining because of the lava sand. Um, we work the plants early in the, in, in the season to, and hold back off the water because it's a heavier, heavier substrate. But once the plants are established, it's, um, it's proven to hold its own throughout the nursery. and We, we quite like it. Uh, what other types of growing medium can you use with Autopot? Well, there, there are a huge amount that we've trialled over the years with Autopot. Um, we use Alpha Mix because it's convenient and easy to use, but there are huge amounts of mixes such as perlite and cocoa and pebbles and cocoa and soil and cocoa, even 100% perlite. Um, in Thailand, we've trialled Autopot using coral that we've taken from the beaches. We've boiled it down. We've then removed the EC or the salt content from the coral, smashed up the coral, placed it in the pot and grown a 20 foot tomato plant. At the Eden Project, for example, we've grown in jeans and bed sheets and pumice stone. Um, we've also grown in wood chips. We've also, which we'll probably show you later, we're growing in just water. Um, so there are a huge amount of, of, of substrates that you can use in Autopot. Pretty much um, we advise customers from overseas that are in remote areas or underprivileged areas to always try and find a substrate that they can source locally, such as just gravel from the, from the roads or something that's convenient and cheap to use. Uh, and that's the, one of the great benefits with Autopot. So really it's down to the individual grower? Yes, yeah, down to convenience? It really is down to convenience. Um, you know, if someone just wants to use something you know, out of a bag, then you can go to the garden centres these days. Um, obviously, we recommend use a free draining substrate, um, and most people do. And it's more forgiving if you use a free draining substrate. Um, if people use peat based compost, for example, they'll generally find that they're very wet and very water retentive, um, and therefore you have to hold the water back to establish the plant. So it's all about knowledge of the grower, and obviously, the environment is key as well. Okay, so we're in the main area now and I can see we've got quite a lot of chilli plants. Um, the first thing I can notice is that some of the pots are on the ground here and some are slightly elevated. Can you explain a little bit about that? Well, traditionally over the last sort of five or ten years, um, commercial horticulture, they've started raising plants um, above the floor level. And there's two main reasons for that. One is to obviously aid air circulation. And the second main reason is to maintain the water temperature in the tray. If we sit the trays directly on the floor, you'll feel, if you put your hand on the floor, you'll feel that the floor is quite cold, particularly in the early part of the season and the end part of the season. Um, by having the tray raised off the floor, we can maintain the water temperature at a more constant level and, and avoid the fluctuations in the day and night periods. Um, it helps growth of the, the root zone. Um, it, and it just increases the, the productivity of the plant. Obviously, if you put them on the floor, the trays on the floor, then you have a you can have a detrimental effect. But we did prove um, this year that the, the growth rate in the early parts of the season, and we'll, and we'll probably notice it at the latter part of the season as well, that the growth rate was probably about 20% greater and faster than it was with the, the trays that were placed on the floor. So, would you say that a nursery this size is commercially viable for growing chilies? In my honesty, Nick, um, not really. There aren't, there aren't any nurseries that I'm aware of in the UK that have full environmental control and heating and, and additional lighting. 
Um, there are a lot of nurseries that I do know of that produce um, chilies for the seeds, actually for the chili plants and to make various chutneys and, and various things like that. But they're pretty much greenhouses that we have that are you know, exposed to the elements uh, day and night and 365 days a year. So from my point of view, um, it's not really that viable because we propagate in January. We raise the plants and bring the plants on throughout the year and we don't really, and we haven't done for the last two or three years, really start picking until July, probably early part in August. Uh, and then we've probably only got two or three months, probably the latest depending on the weather, to the end of October. Um, and that's, that's, you're limited. If we had weather, you know, that was beautiful, um, 365 days a year, then it might, worth, it might be worthwhile looking at. So if you wanted to use this space to grow commercially, what type of crops would you say are the most profitable? Um, well, it's been a difficult um, time over the last three years, sort of trialling various crops. Um, predominantly in the early stages, well last year we grew a uh, thousand chilli plants um, and it wasn't profitable and the work was um, quite arduous. Um, but what we've been doing this year, we've been trialling um, Asian herbs or Thai herbs and obviously what we can do with the herbs, we can cut, we can grow them and then we can cut them and we can do that process probably three, four, five times in, depending on the weather and we've found that we've, we've actually found a good market within the UK to supply cut and also probably next year fresh herbs to the Asian market within the UK. So obviously in the UK we're not blessed with ideal growing conditions. What problems have you faced? Well the great thing is um, it changes every season. It's never constant. You can never predict what the weather's going to be like but last year we had miserable light conditions but we were quite successful. Everything didn't go too badly. This year it's been a really good season. It, we've had to deal with some huge extremities in temperature. We only have the opportunity to open the vents, but by opening the vents when temperatures this July exceeded 51 degrees, we obviously reduce the temperature and increase the airflow, which is great, but in turn we reduce the humidity. And humidity levels in here in July were down at 20%, which is in reality Sahara growing conditions, which are not suitable for commercial crop production anywhere in the world, never mind the UK. But it, we've managed to get through it. Um, the plants obviously reacted. Um, we reduced the food levels, um, obviously, so the plants could survive. But all in all, the environment is um, dictated by Mother Nature. There's really not a great deal we can do. We just have to work with it as best we can. So you, not a lot of the nursery is actually automated. You do all of it by hand, don't you? Pretty, much all, pretty much all of it, Nick, is, is, um, is um, um, human intervention. There's only one shutter that we have um, that is um, um, controlled by a thermostat. Um, but basically what we do is we get up early in the morning and we open the vents if we need to. Obviously we want to try and maintain the humidity in here through around 65, 70, 75% and the temperatures obviously we don't really want them exceeding any more than 30 but in July we, you know, we're at the mercy of the gods. Mm. Over here I've seen some aubergines that look as though they've been hit by a few tricky pests. Shall we go and have a look? Yes, definitely. I'll come. Okay, well some obvious signs here that some caterpillars have already been at your plants um, but what other pests have you had? Um, we've had quite a few problems. The main problem this year was aphid. Um, generally what we do, we try to use either predators or at worst case scenario we use an organic spray. This year, um, just before I went away in July, I noticed there was a, quite a, a bad patch on the, uh, on the aubergines of aphids and uh, I neglected to inform anybody that it was really taking hold. Um, the consequences were, because the weather was so good, particularly for aphids, um, not only for plant production, um, they spread like wildfire pretty much all the way through to the last row um, and um, we had to, had to resort in using organic spray. Well the great thing about the organic spray that we used this year to uh, eliminate the majority of the aphids was um, the, the fact that it didn't kill the predators that we'd introduced earlier on in the season. The ladybirds, the parasitic wasps and the microscopic caterpillars were all left intact and they basically finished off everything that was left and the, uh, the result is that the plants have really turned the corner on, compared to how they did look in, in July. So now we're looking at the, the, the tie leaves that you were talking about earlier. Um, how do you go about managing and growing these? 
Well, this particular bay here, Nick, um, we're growing. We're trialling a new sort of technology with Autopot, where we're not actually using any substrate at all. We're just growing plants directly in water, um, and the effect and the result is quite astounding. Uh, we planted these herbs in probably April time. Um, we've cut th this bay probably four or five times and sent the uh, the herbs to to the restaurants, uh, and the result of probably four five months is quite quite incredible really wow. you've just got a huge root mass and the plant that has been quite butchered severely four or five times um, the discoloration of the roots are just simply a little bit of soil from the the little plugs that were put in there initially and a little bit of seaweed that's been thrown in but as you can see above the, the actual growth is quite spectacular we've probably had out of each tray at least probably I would say half a kilo of herbs on the last five cuts we've done. Now unfortunately you won't get this at home but these smell absolutely stunning. I mean they're just wonderful, it's not like I smell like it. No, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's really effective. Well, we've been contacted by um, quite a few major um, restaurants in the UK because at the moment produce is either restricted out of Asia or is being grown very quickly and um, in Spain or in, in, in uh, Israel and the quality and the flavour is just isn't there. So we bring the seeds in from Thailand, we propagate here probably after we've done the main crop of the chilli and the herbs um, and the result is, is quite spectacular. So these are the same herbs again, but you're growing these a little bit differently, aren't you? Um, we are, Nick, actually. Um, we're using the two-pot extension um, kit uh, from Autopot. And what we've done, instead of using water that I showed you previously, we're actually banking the trays in lines of four. We can grow them in lines of four because obviously the crops of herbs or lettuce or whatever you want to grow, any herb type crop, is very low lying. So we can put the plants closer together. We've got a great environment around the plant. Um, these plants, along with the other ones, have been cut three, four, five times this season. And what we do, we take the two eight and a half litre pots that are in the two pot tray and we sit them on a bed of perlite. You can use ceramics. What this does, if, if we had this pot directly in the tray, we'd drown the plant because there's just uh, too much moisture. So by putting a bed of perlite, probably around 50 mil, it holds it out of the water, but the capillary action obviously makes contact with the, um, the substrate in the pot. And it's just the substrate that we're using in the nursery. And the results are quite astounding. I mean, we've, as I said, we've cut these many times this year um, and they just keep coming back. And the great thing is that we can, we can move them whenever we need to. So what are the main benefits of growing these particular herbs this way than opposed to the ones that we just saw? Um, with the water method, obviously it's been designed for third world countries where they can't get substrate readily available or it's not readily available. This type of technique where we've got four pots in a pot is ideal for us taking the plants out and taking them to, to market. So we, have, we can now supply either cut herbs and they'll come again or we can supply a potted live herb to, to, to the market. So it gives us the ability to take these plants out, move them at will, and also we have the knowledge that they're irrigated and you know, everything is going really well. And also they're very, very easy to maintain when they're this big. And herbs and, 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 and small growing um, crops, generally very, very easy to deal with completely. So I've been here at Jason's greenhouse today and he's very kindly shown us around a lot of the systems he's got. Now, all the plants are filled with this very, very clever little system called the aqua valve, as you can see here. The aqua valve itself is actually made of three bits of plastic and although it looks simple, what it does is actually very clever. Because with this, you can control the water level, or more importantly, the plant can control the water level in this reservoir. The valve allows water to run through this little tube here and fills the tray up to 20 millimetres. Once it's filled, the valve completely shuts off. It won't open again until the plant takes up all of that water. And when the water level's back at zero, the valve opens again, refilling the tray. And this is a really unique way to water your plants.
This episode of Hydro Show is sponsored by Hydromag, the UK's independent hydroponics magazine.